Hi, everyone. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Deborah and Martin Hale Visiting Artist Lecture with Los Angeles-based artist and writer Frances Stark. Frances is concerned with how different modes of communication shape our brains and relationships can help us all navigate these shifts more intelligently. It is the difficult task of visionary artists like Frances Stark to pose questions and make propositions that are unheard of to date, that are uncomfortable, that even could be determined unacceptable. But these grains of ideas shift our collective consciousness and push us towards a better future. Frances's bravery, her self-conscious yet fearless engagements with the most pressing issues of our day are a model for the MFA and for all of us. I welcome and am honored to introduce Frances. Thank you, Liz, for such a wonderful introduction. And um, I want to thank everybody here at the MFA for their um, wonderful welcome. And I've had such a lovely uh, experience engaging with people here. And I'm very, very excited to have this exhibition in a completely different context than, than, what, um, than what it first was born in. Um, so thank you, everybody. And I really, I, as some of you know, as some of I see <laughs> Lois, I hope I don't repeat myself too much. <laughs> a lot of you know I do love to talk a lot. And so it's to, to speak only for 45 minutes about an exhibition with 25 years worth of work is very, very difficult. Um, so. I'm going to uh, try to keep it both short and complicated. <laughs> um, but the thing that's really, really funny is that above our heads is all the work impeccably presented. And so oh, uh, with that, I will say that my slideshow is not impeccably constructed. <laughs> So, um, but here you have the kind of, you know, this is at the hammer, and, and this is the installation of the title wall here. And um, one of the things, uh, I wanted to start off with this, with this work called Non-Electrical Telephony, which is this, these tin can telephones. And um, I wanted to just speak to that work and also um, the, title of the show, Uh-Oh, and um, because when you're trying to title like everything you've ever done, how, how is that even, it's not literally everything I've done, but it is spanning the time I've been making things. Um, it's really, really difficult to arrive at something because I'm such a, a, a lover of titles and I, and I like to... Um, you know, be generous with my titles. And I did a show at MIT several, about five years ago now, um, and the, the title of the exhibition was This Could Become a Gimmick, Sick, because the person who wrote that in the margin of a book spelled it wrong, or An Honest Articulation of the Workings of the Mind. And so I'm typically using these kind of rather lengthy and pithy titles and I really thought for my LA audience that would never fly. <laughs> and that's, um, so Bobby Jesus and I brainstorming when we were trying to imagine the title of the exhibition on a street banner, he came up with uh-oh and it really stuck. And I thought that's the perfect caption for anything underneath. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> Maybe that was some social media damage of imagining people taking pictures. But um, in any case, the, the uh-oh is actually really uh, significant. And, and I do want to point that out before continuing in the sense that while it doesn't necessarily um, describe everything I've done or, or speak to a theme, or it doesn't explicitly do that, it sort of intimates that. And what I think it does is speak to this 
inner mechanism or um, I can't, that word keeps escaping me, a kind of meter or a kind of um, gauge within us to sense when something is not quite right. And the minute we can feel our balance, uh-oh. So we have within us a kind of gauge. You know, each of us, we develop that ethical gauge or gauge of balance or whatever it is. But in the broadest sense, I think there's an ethical one as well. And, and that it is, and that, that sensation, that sensing of something not being right generates something to come out of your throat and out of your mouth. And so in that sense, it merges the textual and the language-based with the body. And I think that's the kind of thrill of um, being able to look at such a long span of work. Okay, so sorry, see, I could, that's, I'm moving. <laughs> uh. So this is uh, the, on the front door, and um, um, let me just show you that this is, it is a funny image and it's a little bit out of context because the one painting that actually has this image explicitly in it, we were not able to, to bring to Boston. And so just to show you that it's a central image on the catalog as well. And um, it appears in one of the posters for the Bobby Jesus's alma mater. And this is a photograph that my father took of me when I was 13. But I, I'm very interested in it in, in this sense in sort of speaking to, for, for the book it was a bit of a, a, a joke about, um, because they're the, end, they're the actual end papers and then on the cover of the book you're seeing the book open. And, um, and the whole book is sort of being birthed out of me. And in this case, you know, the whole show in, in, a, such, in, in a way. But it's also a kind of coy or uh, acute uh, a, a gesture of defiance or putting your butt forward, which is um, a art historically, art, this is an art historical precedent for such a gesture. Um, and this is the Bobby Jesus' alma mater piece as it was originally installed in the Carnegie um, International. And this is a mural that is mounted on the wall. It's a digital print that is affixed to the wall. And all the little pictures, um, you know, if you take the posters away, that's the, what they're there for, you, there's a there is a little index and guide and it'll explain what all the pictures are, but the very center top picture is that um, Diego Rivera mural. And, and then below it you see um, a picture of Bobby Jesus walking with my son down a path. Below that you see a Caravaggio holding the head of the giant that he has slayed. Below that uh, a Goliath and then below that you see my rear just as it appears on the front door of the exhibition and then below that you see a baby's head being guided out of a mother. So, <laughs> um, this is a little detail from the one of the works upstairs and I wanted to, uh, this is neat original file because I wanted to show the Bobby Jesus' alma mater text that shows the handwriting. But I have a lot of technical problems with my computer and I don't have all the files I need. And by beautiful serendipitous chance, which is, plays a big factor in a lot of things I do, um, Steve Shade happened, to, I don't know him, I never met him, here he is. He happened to be walking past and he had all the posters with him. And so I asked him if I could take a picture of the poster, but then of course I had to take a picture of him with the poster. And, um, and then for, after this encounter, it turned out that Steve knew a lot about the subject matter of this work um, because he has um, worked in prisons and taught in prisons and worked with at-risk youth and is an artist himself and a musician and um, he and Bobby spent 
quite some time while I finished making sure my slides weren't all crooked or whatever, <laughs> talking to each other. And um, I did get a little bit nervous when Liz said I am engaging in free schooling because I think I'm fantasizing about that a lot, but I've only truly committed to that in the in my dialogues over the past few years with Bobby Jesus. And so he, he, as a, um, he, the, the piece, that's not technically his name. Bobby Jesus is something that was born of this project as a nickname. And, um, and that's what this slide is supposed to speak to. Um, it, it is, about it, this is a little paper coffee cup. It says for a special teacher, and there's an element of pedagogy at play in so much of my work, and I wanted to just foreground that initially. And alma mater, as most of you know, or you would immediately associate it with a fight song or the school that you graduated from, but we kind of forget that it also literally means nurturing mother. And I was very, very interested in exploring the potential for understanding um, new forms of pedagogy, or, or at least not understanding new forms, but forging new understandings for myself of how to teach um, uh, through, you know, outside of, a, of an institution. Um, here, you, oh, you can't, it doesn't translate, but that's Bobby's face reflected in Diego Rivera's rear. And this is um, one of the pieces. So this is all installed upstairs. So I put this slideshow together, obviously, after I came here. And this is what happens. I kind of, you know, uh, allow for, you know, I guess that I really see, you know, the work as a kind of catapult towards kind of situations or the work allows me, or this kind of institutional support allows for me to, to, to being, having my work hanging, you know, like a two minute walk from this is a very big deal to me. And I don't take it lightly, I think is what I'm trying to say. And it's, um, yeah. Okay, so the quote on the bottom, speaking of for a um, special teacher, is there's a there's a typo in it, but we'll ignore that. It's in my in a video that's downstairs, and it's included in the Bobby Jesus Room, and um, this is a quote from Mike Kelly, who was my teacher uh, it, when I got a degree in fine art, a master's degree. Um, or it's about, yeah, it's about him. And yet he repeatedly made clear that he did not particularly la like pop culture. I think it's garbage, he said in one interview, but that's the culture I live in and that's the culture people speak. I'm an avant-gardist. We're living in the postmodern age, the death of the avant-garde. So all I can really do now is work with this dominant culture and flay it, rip it apart, reconfigure it, expose it, because popular culture is really I think it's, yeah, <laughs> visible, <laughs> visual. People are really visually illiterate. They learn to read in school, but they don't learn to decode images. So the image on the top here is a, a image of a painting that's in the exhibition. It's a back of a peacock. It looks like a turkey because it doesn't have any of the wonderful colors because you, that when you, actually look at a peacock from behind, they're very drab and kind of repulsive. Um, and I had seen a peacock do that, and I took a photograph of it, and I immediately thought of this Ed Ruscha painting. So I think that I'm trying to make the connection with the putting the rear forward. I'm very interested in these gestures this quote, which I'll tell you at the end of the talk, who wrote it, 
Um, in our post-literate world, because ideas are inaccessible, there is a need for constant stimulus. News, political debate, theater, art, and books are judged not on the power of their ideas, but on their ability to entertain. Cultural products that force us to examine ourselves and our society are condemned as elitist and impenetrable. Hannah Arendt warned that the marketization of culture leads to its degradation, that this marketization creates a new celebrity class. Culture, she wrote, is being destroyed in order to yield entertainment. So I think this is the kind of milieu that I find, um, or this is the tension that I am confronting constantly with making um, the work that I make. So if you, the way the exhibition is organized, it's not chronological. So this is a little, I'll show you. Here is what the first, you know, you walk into the first room, and this is like one of the first salon walls you will encounter. And um, a lot of these works are made, have to do with the page, they have to do with books. And so you see this example on the right. You see a piece of paper that's like a large piece. And then within it, you kind of could recognize a smaller page. And then it shows the underlines and the marginalia of a reader. And so the impetus originally of making visual art, of making works on paper, came from my experience of being a reader and my desire to make a visual um, Notate, you know, make visual that connection between the author and the reader. And we often, you know, Liz mentioned the Instagram. There's some, there's a lot of technological, sort of contemporary technological trends or stuff that are kind of brought up within a lot of the work in the show, but I always want to remind people that writing itself uh, with the alphabet is also a technology, as is printing, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm very, very um, interested in that magical ability, or what feels magical sometimes, of somebody else's consciousness having been, you know, edited and decided to, to be put in a very precise form, and that form actually managed to travel over years and years, and, and, and it can go into your brain, and you can turn in, and, and there it is, and you can activate it. And I think that with so much thrill and excitement about the creative class and about art objects and art fairs and art is so fabulously investable or <laughs> worth so much money and it's so fascinating how it's, it's taken this new glamorous role in our culture. We often forget that, that it is a form of, you know, we often sort of lose sight of the kind of fundamental um, b idea of its ability to convey, to be a conveyance of consciousness. And I think that is what's so truly important for me to, to make clear about, um, you know, to, to, to sort of show those moments and, and depict those moments. So, again, um, what... Uh, what time are we supposed to? <laughs> I forgot, I didn't. Um, 7.15 is it when we're supposed to stop? Okay, let's just. <laughs> um, I was gonna say that if you look at that wall, there's a lot of, there's, you know, I also, you know, I'm not just trying to say, oh, books are important, look at these books, I'm gonna put some books and words on a wall. They're visually um, playful, they're very, very formal. I hope that you will go up close to them and engage and discover, um, you know, what's happening within these images. I obviously cannot describe, you know, what, what's, um, 
you know, give you like a n little nugget to tell you how to look at everything because it's it's a lot of stuff. But there are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of recurring motifs, and that was part of the motivation to organize the show without being chronological because we wanted the work to converse amongst itself. So, you know, I notice a lot of little things. So, for example, this piece on the left is called W is for Werther. It's very difficult to see, um, but it'll be moments before you can go look at it yourself, although it is a little high on the wall. But it's a little folder, and it has a little indicating arrow to show that the folder is open. And then all of that line right there are all little Microsoft Word icons. And if you remember, the Microsoft Word icon has a little dog ear on it. And I always thought that was such a funny, cute thing to, to sort of di show the dimensionality of the page. So W is for Werther is a reference to Sorrows of Young Werther, which was written by Goethe, and it's an epistolary novel about unrequited love. And at the end, the, the, the protagonist, the main character, Werther, uh, kills himself. So in that sense, this looks, and, and, and the novel is made up of his letters. So the author tells the reader, I found these letters, here's the story. So this is a literary device in which he's able to create a first person situation without being an omniscient author. And I think that it's such a wonderful story and a sad idea. And, and because, it, and this is something I made very, very early on in my art practice, and it was an attempt and a desire to depict a literary um, concept on a visual plane, and, and I thought about the fact that it was, you know, it was also about me not being trained as a visual artist and not being trained as a painter or a drawer. I, I don't do life drawing. I can't really draw very well. I, I, the, when my son was like four and he asked me to draw Darth Vader, it was like I was mortified. And I drew something, and he was like, that does not look like Darth Vader. <laughs> so <laughs> I, can't, I can't draw. <laughs> but I still am such a visual person, and I wanted to think about what is my line? You know, what is, what is a line that I draw? What is a mark? I was thinking about a Barnett Newman zip or something. It's like, what is my line? You know, is my line like this letter and this letter and this letter and this letter, and then if you pull back far enough, you see this line? I think that's what happens in this exhibition is that you start to see, you know, a lot of people responded to Ali, to the hammer, to me by telling me, I see your brain. Your brain is palpable, your thought is palpable. And that is such a wonderful um, bit of feedback and it's so, um, so heartening to hear it. And I think that what you hopefully, um, with some of the things I'm telling you tonight, you'll be able to enter the work and kind of understand that not for some people, art is an is a experiment in form, or, um, you know, whatever. It could be anything. There's so many different ways to make and exhibit art. But what I'm seeing when I look at all my things together, it's like I truly, truly believe that I, by some freak chance, ended up in visual art because I wanted to be like on a f kind of a, I didn't know if I wanted to be a philosopher or a novelist or something, but I became a thinker, and I used visual forms, and I used the tropes and limitations of gallery, exhibition, contemporary art to explore my thinking. And, and, and there are these incredible um, lines that, that connect between works, between ideas, and stuff. And, you know, that's a privilege for me. I'm not sitting here to say, like, oh, it's just the most, like I imagine that people are going to read it that way, but I know some people do because they've told me that, but I just want to say that, that um, 
I just want to make that clear. So one of the things also, because it, it's like page, 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 there's this, there's this really intense repetition um, strategy that I use. And this is something that's very um, antique. Can you see the ladder reflected in the thing? So this is a, a, a structure that I used for a while, a little formal structure, or something like a screen grab from an old computer. It was a program called Now Up to Date. I don't even remember if it was a calendar slash Excel. I don't know what it was, but some kind of thing like that. But I thought it was the craziest thing that each time you had a new file, the old now turned into no. And I thought that was such a lovely description of linear time that well, the now means that that now is now no, and now it's now, but then now, no, now, no, now. And you just kind of go and go and go, and that within a kind of linear understanding of time, there's like an inherent um, rejection that the last thing wasn't okay. And so there, there's a kind of progress. We must progress because we're never okay. And, um, and I think there's a sort of inherent critique in that, but then there's also a kind of beautiful awareness of a kind of Zen thing. There's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of different ways to read it, but I, I was trying to really zero in on that no, 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 now. One of the run writer who I used some of his old text from years ago in the catalog, he was the first one to read that as a sexual thing, like a climax idea. Speaking of which, uh, Henry Miller played a big role in my coming of age as a thinker and reader, and I, he was also, uh, to be quite frank, the first artist figure I ever imagined or I ever came to know. I never knew, I, don't, I think I was 14 when I started reading him, and that's what an artist was to me, so I wasn't you know, well, sh shortly after I discovered the, you know, Andy Warhol through the Velvet Underground, and then I spent the rest of my life trying to bridge that gap. <laughs> no, but anyway, Henry Miller, as, as you n may know, is very controversial and quite purient, but at the same time quite serious and a s major critic of American culture. And one of the things that runs through this book and Sexus, which is sitting right next to it upstairs, is he worked for some for a, a, what he called the Cosmo Demonic Telegraph Company. So he was essentially critiquing the telecommunications industry at the time and how an impact it had on on um, the American psyche. And I think that plays out in my um, work. This is a still next to it from a film that was essentially, um, it's a feature length film, it's called My Best Thing. It was born out of chat roulette and, and researched or written over Skype, which is a telecommunications um, miracle. I don't know. <laughs> Um, and this is the sequence from the film when there's a Fellini clip, uh, eight and a half. And they're saying, uh, could pornography be the most intense of shows? Um, also, I happen to have, I brought this book on the plane and I was like underlining it. I've already read it before, but it was like a light book. I didn't want to travel too heavy. And uh, I started underlining it more and more. And it's this kind of old, it's a book from the 80s. It's called Entertaining Ourselves to Death. Um, I'm sure you've, some of you here probably know about Infinite Jest and what that implies. Um, and David Foster Wallace shows up in My Best Thing as well. In any case, I just um, pulled these out because there were some kind of great quotes in here. Um, and here is one where he is speaking about the technology of, lang of, of writing. Um, Plato surmised about the consequence of writing. Okay, all that he surmised about the consequence, consequence of writing, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it is another kind of voice altogether, a conjurer's trick of the first order. Um, 
People like ourselves may see nothing wondrous in writing, but our anthropologists know how strange and magical it appears to a purely oral people, a conversation with no one and yet with everyone. What could be stranger than the silence one encounters when addressing a question to a text? What could be more metaphysically puzzling than addressing an unseen audience as every writer of books must do? A correcting oneself because one knows that an unknown reader will disapprove or, uh, or misunderstand. Um, I bring all of this up because what my book is about is how our own tribe is undergoing a vast and trembling shift from the magic of writing to the magic of electronics. And I think that really um, gets at what some of the juxtapositions in the exhibition. There's a more literal <laughs> manifestation of that. Um, and also, um, there's... Uh, a, a big shift towards a very graphic language and a figurative language within the work. And I wanted to show this one view, snapshot from my phone, um, of something that didn't, wasn't happening in the initial installation and it was such a thrill for me. So you see the two peak, you see a peacock way in the distance and you see a peacock in the foreground. And I wanted to just briefly say something about the printed matter and promotional material that's used in those collages. And, um, let's see. Uh, I just, and this, this kind of wonderfully dated book kind of brings it up. Um, the fierce assault on language made by forms of mechanically reproduced imagery that spread unchecked throughout American culture, photographs, prints, posters, drawings, advertisements. I choose the word assault <laughs> um, deliberately here to amplify the point implied in Borston's graphic revolution. The new imagery with photography at its forefront did not merely function as a supplement to language, but bid to replace it as our dominant means for construing, understanding, and testing reality. And then a note on writing and the figure. Um, on the left is a detail of uh, one of the large collages in the first room. It's called, Oh God, I'm So Embarrassed. And the central text in the piece is a poster advertising an exhibition of Sean Landers and the image on the poster is a reproduction of a fax that he sent the gallery complaining about how he couldn't figure out what image to use to promote the show and he's so stressed out and I, I think I just, you know, it's really this kind of neurotic, um, you know, stand-up act, basically. But I was very interested, in, and above, his, he has a hat, a bit, you know, I gave it a hat and a mustache, so you're seeing, like, okay, this is the figure coming into focus here, you know, so where the, where the, where the performative, the performative nature, the performative effect of the text becomes the figure, and the text is not just textual, but it's the figure or the body and a stand-in for the body. And then so next to that you see the inverted instead of the hat on top and the head's on the bottom and she's holding this piece of paper and it says, why should you not be able to assemble yourself and write? So it's like in the case of Sean Landers, it's like, well, I don't know what image to put, but this is for me, because I do write and I did bring this, you know, one of my books um, that's available in the store upstairs. I, <laughs> I have written quite a lot and I used to write a lot and I'm currently struggling with trying to get back into it. And um, so there's something about what I was trying to do in this painting, in this collage, was speak to sort of answer the question at the same time I was posing it and the answer is because I am assembling all these tiny pieces of paper to make the shape of me to be able to ask this question publicly. Um, you know, I mean, it's saying a lot more than that, but I think that those two images next to each other can speak a lot to the use of text and the, the function and purpose of the figure um, within, the, 
work, within the two-dimensional work. And then here's another sort of variation on the theme of why can't you assemble yourself and write, or Sean Lander's neurotic and, you know, uh, you know, confession. In the Fellini bit in the My Best Thing film, the scene that I show is a press conference when the Marcel Marciano, who plays the Fellini character, is being pressured by this giant public and all of the press because his new film's coming. What's it going to be? They're standing in front of this giant rocket launching scaffolding, and there's supposed to be a giant rocket in the, you know, like a phallic symbol in the middle of his film, and he has no rocket. And he, um, he has, the film has turned into, he's having a midlife crisis. <laughs> and, um, and he hasn't quite been able to follow the original proposal that he got all the money for. <laughs> and, um, and, but he has to tell his you know, devoted, anticipating audience what is the film he has to give the talk at the press conference and he cannot deal, and he crawls under the table, and he says, I'm thinking of what I should say, and then he shoots himself. <laughs> <There's a little laughs> this is just, these are some snapshots I took during the installation to show this kind of, um, I mean, this is a terrible phrase to use, but sort of a performance anxiety, I suppose, of you know, of what does it mean to be publicly on display? And what does it mean especially to have to speak about what your work is already doing? And, and, and what happens to that river of wonderful information that comes pouring out of your mouth is it gets turned into something that's easy enough for someone who wants to click onto 20 other things and read on whatever. So in the sense, this like tremendous desire to get something from an artist besides the work itself is something that artists grapple, you know, and struggle with a lot. And, and I, I, I put that forward and, and not just as a kind of form of, oh, I feel sorry for me because people want to know what I'm thinking, it's not that at all. It's, 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 it's a kind of, it has to do with interpretation, it has to do with the text's power to be what it is, and, and whatnot. And I just, I put these in here just to show these different directions. There's a lot of imagery of, of inversions and in one direction first and then flipping. And then here's even a little marginalia from the first um, groupings from that when you enter the gallery, there's a big T.S. Eliot poem that has all these notes on it. And he's, this is the very last line that says, till human voices wake us and we drown. And the person says, lets you down as hard as he lifted you up. Here's this motif again. This is the new vision. It's the name of a work called The New Vision. Um, I have a really funny story about that, but I'm over time. You're right next to it. You see a detail from another one of the works that is a Boetti image called, it's based on, it's slightly altered, uh, Shame and Showman. Um, Allie texted me this, the old vision. <laughs> People who are uh, MFA fans will recognize that work. And you see it's strikingly similar to the new vision there. Here's an up and down. These are based on Goya. Um, I see we're running out of time. I didn't, wanna, I didn't want anyone to miss this because it's very, very hard to see. Um, I wanted to show you um, the yeah, you, it's hard to see here, but don't miss it upstairs. It's a white puddle of paint in the form of a girl that's quite like me. Um, and she's holding this piece of paper to show you. And what you look on the paper, where the image is supposed to be, is a little question mark. I don't know if you can see that. And the title is The Most Beautiful Woman in the World. A uh, little brief comment about the cat videos. Um, those were made before YouTube, and um, they were made with, um, I've just forgotten the technical term, when the sound that's playing in the room is what, you know, where you don't add sound after. It's the, it's some, no, it's not ambient. 
Yes, thank you. <laughs> Diegetic. <laughs> um, so they were all made with these existing uh, songs. This one was from, uh, this is a Black Flag song. Um, and then the little tiny little image on the right is a small little, it's a little zooming into this one drawing that is very easy to miss in the show, so try to find that as a scavenger hunt. No. <laughs> and that's uh, from when I was a teenager and I was in a punk band. Um, yucky and yummy and whatever. Well, let's just, I'm, I'm running out of time. I really am running out of time. So I wanted to say something about this sort of money shot that, you know, um, you'll see it. <laughs> it's exciting. The chorus girls are, um, are central but that what you're missing from that, or what I wanted to say um, that there is a, something going on, why the chorus girls, where, where do they fit into any of this? Well, there's a, sort, there's a, repeti a, a re repetition um, strategy that I use in these early pieces that use text. I showed you here a little sample. This is one, this, um, this is the, the Emptiness in my head could melt with sweet peace into the emptiness of this view. And then it's very, you know, they're actually, it's right next to the chorus girl. So you can kind of compare and think about what that's about. But these, here you see um, a, a, a chorus line with a kind of green paint blob that sort of turns it into a caterpillar. So there's this kind of metamorphosis kind of theme going on. And then, you know, I'm so, this is such a rush. Um, I have so much more to say, but I have to show you because I'm so thrilled. This is not in the show. It's not even done. It's a totally difficult thing. It's a crazy, crazy project I'm working on, but it is the next level of the kind of exploration of pedagogy and the interest in music. I'm doing a, a version of, the, of Mozart's The Magic Flute, which will be a film that you watch in a cinema, and we've just finished recording the soundtrack and it'll essentially be just reading the libretto for the audience with some visual cues to, to speak to certain themes. Um, and I want to give you a little um, taste of this. Two more. I have two. More. I have two more. Right on ten. Opera singers, I have um, the wind and brass playing the characters in the in the opera, so that you'll have the vocal melodies, you know, in your ear um, while you read the lyrics. So the whole proposed, the whole project was billed as a pedagogical opera. That's not exactly what I meant, but it ended up being this incredible journey into understanding how we learn and watching these kids, they, we, they do not exist as a group. We auditioned and we brought together people who could be here with us at this moment in time exactly within these, this very small window and they learned the whole opera in, um, within under a month and it's absolutely extraordinary and I'll just show you, um, it was a... So this is he's this is Pamina. He plays the princess.
So <laughs> I just wanted to leave you with something to be excited about for the future. <laughs> but um, uh, it's funny because there's a little picture that's DJ Quick who, I, who does the beats in, or whose beats I used in the Bobby Jesus' alma mater piece and originally proposed to do the opera with him, but he didn't understand what I was about or he wasn't that excited about it. So I think it's really, it was, this is just a fluke that I was filming off the, off the computer and he's sort of, hmm, maybe I should have gotten involved. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Yes, so I guess we need to open to questions, and thank you. We have time for two quick questions. <laughs> two quick, I'm sorry. Someone? Here's Hi. Um, your work, as I've noted the last few years, is incredible. Um, I kind of see it like a good book or a concept album where it seems to resonate with different people in kind of different ways, both curators I've spoken with, students, and just people who follow you. Um, I was wondering if there's any work you've had anecdotally that like someone gave you a really good story about having lived with it or like X inspired me or that sort of thing. Because I, I see your work as sort of ongoingly generative because it asks all these questions and builds all these like possibilities like a good book. Um, you're asking about a story of, of, of how it uh, touched people? Yeah. Yes. Well, I have pro <laughs> a little bit nervous about trying to pull one out and it will probably be quite long, but I, <laughs> I do, I actually do have, I do hear, I do, people do write me and I you know I was going to show I'm glad I didn't try to include this as well but originally it was meant to be in here I there's a bit in my catalog it's called text conjuxit I kind of forgot what it's like texts stitched together I think is the Latin that's what I was trying to go for um, and it's it's um it's actually Built, it's the, the idea is like instead of getting a third writer to like go online and read what everyone wrote about me and get to know me real quick before their writing deadline is up, I was like, I wasn't really interested in that. So I wanted to show that my work has engaged people, not necessarily the hottest writer that people want in art catalogs at the moment, but just anybody. And I've gotten some pretty crazy fan mail, not a lot, but a handful. And I did a show um, uh, 13 years ago. I could remember that number because that's I was pregnant with my child. And, and um, it was at the Hammer. And it was a special projects piece. And there's only one piece from, of that body of work in the show. It's called The Unspeakable Compromise of the Portable Work of Art. And there's a little takeaway, or not a takeaway, it's a little uh, printout. You can read some of the text. This guy was reading the text, engaging the show. I think a lot of the work was really inscrutable to most people. But there was a kind of comedic, performative element happening in the writing. He wrote me a letter. And he described the whole experience and how other people were like, hmm, oh. And he was like, I was laughing, and I thought you were Salinger, et cetera, et cetera. And it was such an extraordinary um, experience uh, because these are the reasons why we make things. Because I'm not going to make a hedge fund manager who flips art for, you know, for kicks weep. It's never going to happen. I'm not going to impact his life. He's not ever going to even buy my art. <laughs> or, who, or some, you know, Russian oligarch or something. I don't, you know, I mean, nothing against, well, yes, something against. <laughs> but I do have those stories, and when I installed at the Carnegie, as Dan remembers, the guards, one guard in particular, 
you know, the one guard, she had been in the previous installation, which was Mike Kelly. She knew the Mike Kelly in, inside and out more than probably, you know, the art writer who, you know, whatever. He, she really was into it. Then the other guard was like coming up to the Bobby Jesus, looking at everything like, oh my God, what are you doing? We got in this major dialogue. It was super interesting and really... You know, it wasn't just like, oh, you're great, you like rapper. You know, it was deep and it was difficult and it was enriching. And and my art has, you know, shown that that is still to this day a possibility. And meeting Steve today by complete chance, who had just experienced my work, he had no idea who I was, he had the posters in his hand. You know, that is why I do it because you can get on the cover of five different magazines, you can get in the New York Times feature fashion issue, and they won't even call you an artist, they say the art of narcissism. And it's like, I don't care about that. They will never represent what art is capable of doing, ever. Sorry, no, I'm mad. <laughs> Do we have one more question? <laughs> that was also a, a lovely moment to end if okay. you have not one question. <laughs> All right, well, thank All you right. so much. Thank Francis. you, thank, thank you. you.